Hi, everybody. Podcast 20 with Joe Bergamini. Welcome to Drum Education Live. Subscribe to our channel. We have amazing interviews, and this is another one of them. So, because I invited you to be here, I, I have the responsibility of asking the first question. And let me set up the question. Uh, a couple of years back, I was, I was listening to a podcast. Uh, I forgot which what the name of the podcast was, that you were being interviewed. And the question was, if you thought it would be worth it to spend a lot of money in going to university to, to, to get a music performance diploma. And, and you thought, and at that time, at least, your thoughts were like, mm, probably not, because of that, of that joke of, you know, if you freeze a musician now and you unfreeze the guy in 100 years, He'll, and the pay is going to be exactly the same, and he's not going to realize the time has passed. But then, the other day, uh, in the Sen uh, webinar, uh, you were talking that your son, Nick, decided to follow your footsteps, which obviously makes you immensely proud. But then, I want to know, what advice did you give to your son? <laughs> nice. Well, thank you for having me today. You go right for the jugular, don't you? Yeah, exactly. That's how we roll. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, well, that's, that's an interesting question. So um, I think that uh, I heard someone give the advice, and I don't remember who it was, um, to ask an, a young prospective drummer um, the question, is, is there anything else in your life that you do that you enjoy doing as much as, or almost as much as drumming, or let's say music, whatever instrument you play. And if they answer, if you can answer that and say, yes, do that other thing. That was the advice. <laughs> um, and the reason why the person gave that advice was because um, this is not, not an easy way to make a living. It's obvious. And, um, and the landscape keeps changing you know, on a near daily basis. But um, I think the main reason I may have answered the question the way I did was because in saying that it might not be worth it is because one of the things that I think is still really cool about what we do as drummers and even as private drum teachers is that at the end of the day, it only matters what you sound like or what you teach like. Nothing, nothing else matters. People don't care. You know, I have a diploma that hangs on my wall. It's not a music diploma. Uh, or about degree, um, you know, nobody really cares about that stuff. So if you go down the list of all our favorite drummers and, and, um, and things like that, you're going to, I think, find many of them, excuse me, many of them have college degrees and many of them don't. And so I think, you know, the things that you have to learn Certainly some of the programs that are put together by, like if you go to USC and you're studying with Peter Erskine or at your hum, you're at Humber College in Toronto with Paul DeLong and Mark Kelso. Um, my son's going to New Jersey City University with Tim Horner and of course there's John Riley's on faculty at NYU. I mean, yes, you're, of course you're going to get an amazing education. And I play on Broadway in New York with tons of amazing musicians who went to a music, uh, <clears throat> have music degrees. So. Um, but I, I don't think it's the only path. And I also think that uh, the other skills that you need to be successful doing this, um, you know, you can, you can sort of pursue something else that can help you and pursue your playing. We have so many great private teachers available. Everybody I just mentioned teaches privately. So the way I did it, <clears throat> excuse me, the way I did it was private study with great teachers, legendary teachers, and I majored in something else now. I did that because my dad at the time was like, I'm not paying for you to go to music school. He didn't know anything about it. He thought it was like, and I thought it was like, either you're a rock star or, or you have a regular job, quote unquote. Like I didn't know about teaching and editing and writing books and, you know, doing other things in the business. So, um, so all that to say that if you love it and it's your passion, I think, I think you should do it. I, I don't, I guess I, what I was saying is I don't think it's necessary for success. In the case of my son, um, he's been watching me and he's friends with all of my friends and he's studying with Dom and he, he just 
loves it. He, he just wants to do what I do. And there's nothing that makes me happier. I, I never, I never did anything to try to steer him towards it, but except for taking him to see concerts with me and like taking him to drum clinics. And he was, hang, you know, hanging out with all of the drum, you know, all of our drum buddies and friends and um, listening to the greats and stuff. And he just, he just decided to like gravitate towards it. And he just, the fire got lit within him and he just loves playing. And he, he, he loves all the same drummers that I loved. And he downloaded all the music from my iTunes onto his phone and he, he knows all the stuff. And so, you know, it's, you know, who's, why, why, why would I ever discourage him from, from following his dream? He has the same dream as I had and hopefully he'll surpass whatever, you know, small accomplishments I've been able to do. But he's, he has that passion for it. And, um, but he also has seen what I do other, other than playing. And so he wants to teach, he wants to do, um, he ready to do other things in the business. He's seen how I work with Hudson music actually, um, with Wisdom, the company that Dom and I own to publish, which Philippe, your book is with us, and Hudson, we both of our companies have actually given Nick a little bit of work. Okay, cool. There's a leg up, you know, he's in the family, so he's, he's mm -hmm. got, you know, an inside track there, but uh, starting to train. So yeah, but he's going to, he's double majoring in performance and marketing. Okay. And um, you know what, if you're, I look at it this way, if you're young and you work really hard, and you're, you know, you're in your early 20s and you want to go and you want to pursue it and you want to major in music or, or, or not major in music, but you want to get in a van and go, well, when it's safe to get in a van again and go travel around and play <laughs> gigs, um, you know, you can reinvent, you know, you just go for it and just, you just don't want to be, you know, I, I never wanted to feel like I, I, um, I, I should have, would have, could have, you know, I could have been, I could have done it. I wonder what would have happened had I, had I given it a try. I never wanted to have that feeling. And, um, you know, I always use my brother as an example, who, who obviously I love very much. My brother, Steve, is a really terrific guitar player. He never got into teaching that much as I did, but he loves to play and he still plays. Very serious player, like many of, I'm sure all of our students, like I have students who are stockbrokers or um, FedEx drivers, you know, any kind of doctors, pilots, any kind of job you can imagine. They love the drums and they take their drumming as seriously as we do but they do something else for a job. So in the case of my brother, you know, he, he tried really hard to do the performance thing. And then, and then I think he realized he wouldn't be happy with what he was able to put together and maybe a little unstable on the income side, you know? And when he was about 30, he reinvented himself and he learned app design. He went, he had, he had a four year bachelor's degree. He went back to a two year like technical school, learned how to do app design and he's kicking butt now. He makes a ton of money. So like you can, at 30 years old, I mean, you're a young person, you can just try your best. And you know, if you fall on your face, or, or, or maybe you don't, you know, this COVID thing is really exposed the soft underbelly of what it yeah. means to rely on playing, you know, all my <clears throat> friends that I work with on Broadway, who just played the people who, you know, guys and girls who were the envy of, the, of town, because they always had a show and they always had a gig and they never needed to do anything else. They have no work. And we don't know when they're going to have work again. So, um, yeah, we just, we just, sadly, it's, it's unstable and you have to just know that and accept it. And, uh, anyway, I have a way of going off and on tangents with every question. <laughs> did I answer the question? I hope I did. Yes, you did. <laughs> I wanted to ask about, um, playing on Broadway, um, because, you yeah, know, you're an amazing player, I think it's a given and your reading is, has to be incredible. But I'm wondering for, you know, people who want to do that kind of drum and gig, what place does networking play in playing that gig? Or is it, you know, audition? Uh, yeah. That's a great question. Um, the au auditioning is rarely a factor, actually. Um, it's a scene, you know, it's a, it's a scene and, um, it's a scene like where, not unlike any other scene, like my local cover band scene when I was coming up, I, you know, I, I've met a couple people, started to play, and then, you know, we were sort of okay, and then I played in public, and then somebody was in the audience or on the bill, a guitar player from another, oh, you're great, man, we should start a project, and then, so <clears throat> you get into town, and um, people have to hear you play, and then 
once once basically the way most people break in to the scene is so someone will hear you play that is already in the scene either they're playing on a show they're subbing a show or they know they know someone that needs a sub and they have to know you're playing well enough to stick their neck out for you to say hey you should check out kira or you should check out philippe or you should check out joe um and then typically the way most people break into the scene is by subbing is that how you did it yes that's how i did it and and um we actually had had a great uh sen round table i had uh, larry lelly sean mcdaniel and gary seligson who are three of the top uh, broadway drummers who have always had shows they're they're guys that i admire and, and um they're all great people too just wonderful friends of mine sean was at frozen which sadly closed due to the covid pandemic but he was the original drummer for book of mormon larry was at come from away which i was learning to sub for him when you know i don't tell larry i stopped shedding but i'll, I'll get back to it <laughs> um, and then uh and then um larry's been at, i subbed for him at million dollar quartet and then he's had he was at the producers he wrote the drum book for the producers huge hit and then gary he got on the map by subbing for Tommy Igo at Lion King, which I also did. And um, then he was the original drummer for Wicked. He left Wicked to do Tarzan, where he became friends with Phil Collins because Phil was the music you know, writer for the show. And then um, I subbed for Gary uh, at School of Rock, the Andrew Lloyd Webber production of that. So th those guys, we had the same discussion. <clears throat> you break in by subbing and the way you do it is you just have to be playing on the periphery of the scene with someone who's in the scene. And then when the chance comes that somebody needs a sub, they know about you and they're like, Hey, let's give this person a try. There's no auditioning to sub. Mm -hmm. Like they just have to trust you. And then you learn the book and then you go play the show. And if you crash and burn, you're done. You're fired the first time. And if you crash and burn the second time, you could be fired that time too. It's a very, one of my friends who hadn't subbed for years, he had a show and then he had to sub. He's like, your brand is on the line every time, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so uh, that's typically how, how you would break in to the scene. And then getting a chair is a whole nother thing. Um, getting a chair can ha getting a chair happens because the musical director, sometimes the contractor, but it's less common now that because the drums are so core to all these new shows because they're always, you know, it's not like um, the old shows like South Pacific where it was big band or, you know, where the, you know, a show like um, Kinky Boots or, or The Lion King or whatever, like the drums are core to the show. Like the drummer can crash the show, like, and they're always there at the beginning. So what's become important is you have a relationship with the musical directors um, and the contractors who are putting the core groups together. So when I had finally got my chair at getting the band back together, I had worked with Sonny Palladino, the musical director. I had subbed on shows where he was an associate conductor. I had subbed under him while he was conducting. We became friends. And then I subbed in the doo project, which is my group that I'm in now. I subbed in the doo project. So he already knew my personality. He knew that we got along. He knew how I played. He knew I could take direction without complaining very much maybe <laughs> um, and uh and so like so there so you can if you have that relationship with someone who's starting a show you can actually come in and, and nail it get a chair without ever having subbed and there are there are a bunch of people who have done that um so if you so you sort of have to i think to get a chair you cultivate relationships and a lot of times what happens is um, you get asked to do workshops, which are little trial runs of shows that they do. And, and just, just so you guys know, the workshops and the side sessions that you get, that's where your reading comes into play. If you're subbing, little secret, if you want to break in subbing, like your sight reading doesn't have to be that good. You're not sight reading the show. You better have practiced it a hundred times. Like, like I'm not, it's, it's prepared reading. Like you're, you're reading it, yes, for the arrangement, but you're not sight reading. So you, you can be like a mediocre reader and sub and succeed because you have to practice the show like a gajillion times until you play it exactly like the chair holder. Um, and, the, you know, so all the, all the years I spent in a Rush tribute band trying to learn Neil's Phil's note for note, I mean, that's how I learn a Broadway book when I'm subbing. You, you have to hit like the person you're subbing for. You have to play, you know, 
if I'm watching John Weber at Rock of Ages and I watch John, I went and watched the show. I'll go watch anywhere from six to 12 times before I play. Wow. Um, John played the fills the same way every time. Like Neil, he thought he, he created a book and he played it. That's a hint, people. Play the fills like John and they will, you know, if you can f make it feel like him and play like him, then obviously, you know, so, so yeah, so that, so your ability to um, do the networking is key and that goes down to your personality also. And I think you're, you're asking about that. Like, so once you are trusted enough to get a shot, the networking thing gets you there. And then once you're in the pit and you're able to play the personality thing and the networking thing works because hopefully if you succeed, you, if you walk into a pit and you do well, um, for instance, I walked into a hot seat at Jesus Christ Superstar, unfortunately short lived revival of it here in New York. Um, but a hot seat on the drum chair, as you guys know, it put Simon Phillips on the map in London in the West End, you know, years and years ago. So um, I, I, it was up my alley, you know, it's like prog rock stuff and I, I loved it. So I came in and I did well. I instantly made like 10 friends who like were pretty like well established in the, in the scene. So then, then they will be able to recommend you. And then equally as important, when you're a sub, you get notes, like you just, you know, it's not, if, if, if the conductor says, you know, you were pushing that part, but you don't think you were pushing that part, you were pushing that part. You just have to be like, yes, okay. You have to be able to take direction. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so your personality really, really factors in, especially when you're subbing. Cool. So talking about um, your influences in prog rock and, and, and stuff, so was Rush like the band for you when you started or there was something that led to Rush? Um, I turned on the radio when I was 13 years old and I heard uh, Rush, the song Subdivisions, and it just captured my imagination. I wanted to play drums. Also factoring in were Dance the Night Away by Van Halen uh -huh. and, and Separate Ways by Journey. I had a cassette where I had captured those. I pressed record and then I played it back. So um I fell in love with Rush. I worshipped Neil. I, I played along to Rush every single day. But but I was also into all the popular bands of, of the time. So at the time, like ZZ Top, Eliminator was huge. Night Ranger was huge with Sister Christian, Midnight Madness, that record. And then I got really into Dio and Ozzy. And I played along and Maiden and Judas Priest and all the popular metal bands that all the cool kids were into. You know, I'm talking about uh, I was in high school from 84 to 88. And um, so I, I played actually along to a lot. I, I, I played along to like a lot of Rush. I mean, I, I, Neil was my hero, full on. Mm -hmm. And um, I wore out VHS tapes of Exit Stage Left. And, and yes, and, uh, I, w I w eagerly awaited every Rush tour and, and went to see him. And, and he was my favorite, favorite. Um, but I was in bands in my town, in my school. I had one friend who liked Rush and none of the other kids could, we couldn't find a bass player that could play it. So we, me and my friend Paul, uh, who passed away sadly a few years back, we uh, always had a band and we played all the other stuff, all the metal that was popular. And I also played, like, if I liked the song, I played along to it. So I, I played along and I didn't realize I was teaching myself. It was, in retrospect, I'm so glad I did that. Like I played along to, you know, Sharp Dressed Man as much as I played along to YYZ. And I, I really got into like making it feel good. I, you know, I've, I'm, when I was in the Rush cover band, Power Windows, I, I, met, I met, you know, I, I would go to see other tribute bands or I would meet people and like they could, they could play the notes, but it just didn't feel like Neil or it didn't really feel like grooving actually, you know? Um, so yeah, so I got into all that stuff and I, uh, and I, there were certain records I learned like note for note and I would just play like, the album Holy Diver by Dio with Vinnie, Vinnie Appice on it. I, I knew that record. Like I would, I would just like to play and not be able to hear Vinnie, just hear me, you know? <laughs> um, and I, I did that with like Number of the Beast, um, Peace of Mind, although I wasn't really playing all the notes Nico plays. He's sick. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so, so I, I was just like, and then of course I was into Van Halen. Again, didn't really understand everything that Alex was doing until much later, like total unsung hero to me, like yeah. Larry. 
Um, and then when Greg Bisson, when David Lee Roth went solo, I went to see the Eat Him and Smile tour twice. I became a huge fan of Bissonette and he was the first drum clinic I saw. Okay. And, um, yeah. And then, so I knew, and then I started reading Modern Drummer. And so I knew the names of every famous drummer, but I, and I read their interviews, but I didn't listen to them because I wasn't into jazz. Like I was, <laughs> I was into jazz if I had to learn a song for jazz band in high school. Um, but th those were kind of my early, um, favorite players and, and and i really i just went to see all the so you shows. always had this this thing of playing note for note regardless if it was zz top or rush yeah pretty pretty much i was just like i want to learn you know that's so cool i want to learn that okay you know but i would but i would totally like after i watched neil solo yeah i would i would sit down and just you know like i tell my students you know pr practice practice the stuff for your lesson that's, that's a portion of your practice. Then play along with your favorite music, either note for note or however you want. And then just sit down at your drums and play freeform, you know, and then active listening, you know, to something that's, you know, those are the, I think that's a four part menu for what I think is a good diet of, you know, drumming. But yeah, I, I, um, I did play a lot of freeform and as soon as as soon as like somebody came across my radar and I realized they were great, I was I was in like like all of us like I had no prejudice to anybody. I just jazz didn't resonate with me at that age, and I, and I didn't get into it until later. Um, but uh, so then what happened was, but I was always in bands. I, I actually had my first gig. I I guess I must have been one of those people in retrospect that like. I could play a groove pretty much out of the gate because I got a drum set and I had my first gig in my friend's basement like a month later. Wow. <laughs> and, and, and I, you know, I mean, I, I don't have a recording of it, but I have a recording of a, my band that I was playing for about a, a year and a half after. And it was like, you know, there's, you know, there's a, some people just like, it's like athletics or, or any other thing. Some people just take to it and they can do it. Um, so, I was just, it was just my favorite thing to do. I mean, I would play along with records for like two hours every day after school. Wow. Nice. At least two hours, sometimes more, and sometimes free form. Cool. Kira? Um, I wanted to know how you're doing with this whole COVID situation. Uh, well, um, not playing with other human beings sucks. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, like I said, I've had gigs on my calendar since I was 13. I would have gigs on my calendar and in my life if I was making zero dollars from drumming. Uh, don't tell anybody who hires me that, but. <laughs> uh, but, you know, like I, 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 part of what I like to do and I've always liked to do my whole life is be in a band and play. And uh, I can't do that now. And I had just done my longest tour um, with the Duo Project. I, I've never been like in a rock band that did a really long tours. I've done Broadway tours. I did a Broadway tour with Moving Out for a year. Um, so my group, the Duop Project, is kind of in and out. Like we fly out, do a bunch of shows, sometimes a few days, sometimes a week, sometimes two weeks. But we were out for three weeks and then home for four days and then out for a month. So it was like, you know, well, I'm almost 50 years old and I'm finally touring with a band. And <laughs> COVID came and just sliced the end off. Boom. Um, so that part, that part really sucks. And, um, and I think everyone's going to never take a gig for granted again. Mm. Uh, I know I won't. And hopefully someday it gets back to what it was. But luckily for me, uh, due to the kind of diversification that I've always enjoyed in my career, um, I'm doing, I'm teaching all online and it's very, it's stayed steady and actually gotten a little busier. Mm -hmm. um, and I still, I'm the editor for Hudson Music. That's gotten probably busier. I, I guess everybody in a, in a pandemic shutdown, everybody wants to write a book. So I guess. <laughs> um, and then with Wisdom, Dom and I always have our couple of projects that stayed steady. And then I, the Sabian Education Network, you know, all the companies, the manufacturers kind of cut back on employees, but Sabian did, you know, thankfully, thank you, Sabian, uh, see me as important enough to kind of keep me on board to a certain degree. Cool. And, uh, so, yeah, so I, I, I've been, you know, needless to say, I've been uh, one of the lucky ones. And, you know, a lot of my well-known or even not so well known, you know, a lot of my successful player friends have been like, man, you know, you're so, so smart that you, that you diversified all this. But honestly, like, 
Number one, I'm not that smart. Number two, um, <laughs> I, I, teaching is something I love to do. Like we all know, you can't teach unless you love it. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Well, it's a pandemic shutdown. I think I'll teach for extra money. It's like, okay, well, that's cool. But like, if you don't really like it, I think people are going to know pretty quickly. You know, I, I, I have a passion for it. So I, I, I always, I, I've always kept my students there. Like I'd come home for a week off the road and just schedule everybody in. And you know, your, your students, I think, they dig it when you're yeah you know, true. my teacher's playing on broadway my teacher's on tour like they like that you know yeah mm -hmm. so i never yeah. had a problem with that yeah and then and then um the the thing with hudson like i always was into books i always wanted to transcribe i always liked seeing how it looked on paper we just had david garibaldi on the scn um show oh, yesterday yeah. he, same thing like he's like that he likes to like trans we actually he and i like total geek moment we're like i i, I sent him some of my this is the thing that he sent me that he played yesterday, um, this ladder thing. He sends it to me. Here's the uh, transcription of my epic fail on the pod on the show yesterday. <laughs> and then I sent him back. Uh, he it's like. And then I sent him back uh, some of my stuff, and it's just so cool trading. But you know, I always had that like, I got that old Rush drum transcription book, and when it was too late to play, I would read along and be like, oh, that that's what that fill looks like. And so, I, and then I I always enjoyed reading and writing and and. Um, like in college, I noticed that I could, I would never like do any of the things they said to write papers. I would never write an outline, but I, I would just be like, I got to write that paper. It's due in three weeks, but I have a gig the four nights before that. And I have this other project due and I'm teaching. So I have to write this paper tonight. So I would just sit down for an hour and write it. Boom. Like, but, and work out the thoughts in my head. And I got like straight A's. And like, I remember the English professor was like, did you ever think about going into writing? And I'm like, no, like no one. Like I wasn't even, I was, you know how in high school, middle school, they like put you, they don't categorize you or whatever. I was never put into like the honors writing or whatever. Like no one picked that out as a, as a skill that I had. So like, I just never planned on doing copy editing or any of the stuff I do for Hudson. I just, I don't mind doing it. And I kind of enjoy it now. I'm, you know, I guess it suits my OCD to move commas around and stuff like that. <laughs> um, but, but like that, 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 uh, I guess w w all this to say that the diversification that's kind of saved my butt during the shutdown is nothing more than the product of my interests coming into different ways to generate income and, and enjoy doing stuff that's related to drums. Like I like writing about drums. Yeah. I like playing the drums obviously, but I like writing about the drums yeah. and I like writing out the drums and I like talking about the drums and I like, talking about drum teaching with other drum teachers and running a club for drum teachers and what the heck, why don't we just make all this part of our job? Cool. All right. We're in the last 10 minutes of our little chat. Uh, th they say never meet your idols. Not only you met Neil Peart, you worked with him. How was that? Uh, it was a dream come true. Um, but it was hard to talk to, to work with him or uh no he he's he's a special case of a person that was he was the biggest for me he was the biggest uh drum star i ever met and everybody knows that he was guarded and super private so um the way that i was i met him because hudson rob and paul at the time wanted to do the project with him the dvd and eventually the book which i tacked on and neil went along with um so i had to write a proposal for him and then it was given to him. And that went through stages where like, I couldn't, I didn't have his email address. They would just report back to me like, oh, Neil liked this, Neil liked that. And then it was only until Neil started to get interest, interested and saw some of my writing in the proposals. And Rob and Paul said, you know, you'll be comfortable around him, that he agreed to meet me to see if he would be comfortable. And so they, Rob took me to a Rush concert and I met him backstage. Actually, I met him for the first time on his tour bus, which is like going into his house, right? Yeah. And then he brought me out and, and sat me behind the drums and, and wow. it, yeah, it was like, if you told me, if you told my 14 year old self that that day would have happened, I would have been like, yeah. <laughs> and then, um, you know, he, he was like a very private man. Like I became friends with him, but you know, he wouldn't, if I emailed him something and he didn't have like a detailed answer for it, he wouldn't write back sometimes. And then sometimes I'd be like, I'm coming out to play to LA. And then nine times out of 10, he would get back to me like, 
a week before I was leaving and say, hey, you, you know, you, if you're still coming out, why don't you come down to the cave, his little hangout spot, to have lunch. Um, so in my case, uh, it, it was just a dream come true. And he agreed to do the book, basically let me do the book. And then he put his, wrote the forward and he helped me with pictures. And, um, and then he would have me be a guest every time Rush came to town. And, cool. But he would never let me introduce anyone. He would never let me bring anyone yeah. to meet him unless he wanted to meet the person. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. And cool. uh, I've met all my other idols too, living idols too. And I have not one single bad experience to report. Drummers are just great people. True. I have to agree with that. Kira. Okay. Final question. Um, what do you think is missing from drum education today? What do I think is missing from drum education today? Um, that's really hard. I think drum education today is in a really good place, actually. Um, I mean, aside from just not being able, you know, I, I, the, the, decision of whether to get together with students in person right now is, I don't know how it is in Europe, but in the States, it's kind of a free for all here. So like, if you want to do it, go ahead and do it. I personally, am not doing it. And I have, I have, you know, it's mostly people my age um, that have been asking, can I come back? Can I come back? The people I would say 30 and younger, like they could care. They're like, yeah, our mine's fine. They're so used to that type of stuff. But like, I have some guys in the neighborhood of 50, and it's actually, come to think of it, it's all men who are breaking my chops about it, <laughs> um, that want to come back. That and and you know what? There's certain people that just learn better when they're here with me in the room. And 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 I think hearing, I no matter unless unless someone has mics and all that, I don't hear their sound as accurately as I hear it when they're here. And that's a big thing I started doing with my aspiring pro students and like weekend warrior type students is like, a lot of times it's like they're playing the right notes. They just don't sound like a pro yet because they're not getting the right balance or they're not hitting right. It's harder for me to do that online. I can still do it. It's just harder. But as far as like the content, I don't think anything's missing. As a matter of fact, I think there's just so much information that if anything, you need more guidance to like know what to do, what you need to do. Like, like every star has an online school now. Should I go to Weckl's online school? Should I go to Stan Moore's online school? Should I go to Thomas Lang's on online school? You know, and then name somebody who you want to take a lesson from. Everybody's at home. You take a lesson from anybody, practically. Uh, well, as long as they have drums there, right? Like you can have a lesson with Weckl if you want. He, I think he gives, he's doing some one-on-ones. Garibaldi's doing a few one-on-ones. So yeah, I don't, I think the world is your oyster, you know? Yeah. Um, but, you know, find a teacher. I think finding a teacher is so important. I still think that one-on-one -on -one feedback of what you're doing is, is super important. Cool. Are you going to leave at that? Yeah, I th I'm thinking if I have anything else to add. But, you know, like I said, I think it's in a, in a pretty good place. I think the, only, the biggest challenge we face is uh, my unscientific but frequently observed um, problem or issue I think we face is that there's just not as many young kids playing drums. And my, my hypothesis is because they're just not exposed to um, seeing drummers in uh, their public, uh, celebrated in the public eye as much as they were when I was a kid. I try to be very like dispassionate about it. Like I think Lady Gaga is a great artist. She always has a great drummer and you, it's Spanky or wh whoever, Brian Fraser or whoever's playing with her is always amazing. But like when she played the Super Bowl, you only saw Brian like in the background for like two shots. It's like, sh show him, man. Like if it was <laughs> Van Halen, like the, the drummer was a star. Like yeah. an MTV played, MTV played actual videos or you went to the Savoy Ballroom and the lights were on Gene Krupa or... So like now you just, the musicians don't get seen. They're, the musicians are as amazing as ever, but it's all of my young students, their parents either suggested an instrument or their parents turned them on to Zeppelin or Rush or all the bands that I grew up on. So the, 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 the flame still ignites for kids to play drums. We're just, we just don't have the spark along the road for them like we used to, I don't think. 
So if we get that back, we're going to have zillions of kids playing drums. And I know, for instance, like in China, they have a huge sur surge of drum students there because it's, from my understanding, it's like kind of a cool, it's like self-expression, but it's physical, like athletic and they've started to get exposed to it in a way that seems cool and fun and a little competitive for them to do it. And so they're, they're having a real renaissance, uh, you know, not a renaissance because it's the first time for them, but it's really growing there. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I just, I don't know. Maybe I think we need a new Beatles. Maybe we do need a new Beatles. If you, if you go to, to the whole, that whole generation, Jeff Percaro, Dom, Lib DeVito, Greg Bissonette, all, everybody who's like put around 70 now, every single one of them. It was, I saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan and I wanted to, yeah. you know, it's like, it was a tidal wave. And then Neil created a mini tidal wave. And then yeah. was, we don't, we need a, a new tidal wave of a real drummer in a huge society changing band to, and then maybe we'll, maybe, maybe that will be, that would be awesome. That would be awesome. All is not lost without it. I don't want to give that impression, but that would be awesome. Cool. Well, we just about have time to say goodbye. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. This has been thank wonderful. You. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for accepting the invitation. And it was a, I had a great time. Thank so you. Thank you. Thanks, Kira. Thanks, Philippe. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay.